In this video, we're going to look at a couple different advanced ways to use if functions and case statements to make kind of logical decisions within our VBA user defined functions. So the example I want to use here is one on depreciation. So we're going to assume that we have a depreci depreciable asset, some fixed asset uh, worth $10,000 in this case. It's going to have a useful life of seven years. And now we got to decide how to calculate the depreciation based on the method that the user chooses and whether it's section 179 eligible. All right, so let's talk about the depreciation method in this section 179, because that's going to dictate how we do our calculations. So for depreciation method, there are going to be three different choices we're going to have here. The first is going to be S, which is going to be straight line depreciation, the most common schedule, or, the, or rather the most simple schedule we can do. So that'll be an S. D will stand for double declining balance, where you take two years of depreciation in that very first year. Finally, the third method is going to be makers. I forget what makers stands for, but it's a way that uh, a depreciation method the accountants like to use a lot. It essentially entails half of double declining balance in the first year, which turns out to be the same as the straight line method for at least the first year. Now, those are going to be the standard methods. For any of those methods, though, if the asset qualifies for Section 179, what that's going to mean is that you can depreciate the asset over two years. Regardless of what this useful life is, you can depreciate the asset half in the first year, half in the second year. So essentially, if you have six, Section 179, the depreciation method is no longer going to matter. It's always going to be half in one year, half in the next. So that's the basic structure of how our inputs are going to affect how we calculate the depreciation. Our challenge in the code is going to be to handle all these logical issues, right? We have to check what is the depreciation method, S, M, or D? And what about section 179? Is this a yes or is it a no? So we're going to see a couple different ways to do this. Let's get into the VBA code. All right, so we're starting with a little bit of code already written, but this is stuff you've all seen before. Start out with some commenting. That way we know what all the different input parameters are. And I've defined the function. We've called it depreciation amount. We have that amount as a double, useful life as a long. All right, what is long? We haven't seen this before. Long is a bigger integer. Long essentially uses a little bit more storage space in the computer's memory, but allows for bigger integers that get much larger or much more negative as well. So it's a variable type that you really don't need too often, but if you're dealing with big numbers that are integers, you do. So here it's just a, a chance to show you guys another variable type. Method, that's going to be the depreciation method. That's going to be a string variable, right? The user enters it as a string of characters. And finally, sec 179, that's section 179. That is also going to be a string variable. And then finally, depreciation amount, we expect that to be a double precision number. Right, so it's a number that can be several decimal places. All right, so we've written our function. We've defined it at the top. We do need to make our function equal to something. Let's just start out and make that depreciation amount equal to one. So at least our function is working. Now we're going to do a couple steps along the way here. The first thing I'm going to do is introduce a new concept. And that's going to be to initiate a temporary answer variable. All right, so we're going to dim answer as double. So this value answer, we're going to keep track of in our logical calculations along the way. Essentially, we're creating a temporary value to store answer, to store our calculations. That way, we don't have depreciation amount floating around our whole program. It's really just a little bit of a way to clean up our code, make it a little bit more clear what we're doing. To that end, I'm just going to replace depreciation amount. I'm going to set it equal to answer at the very end. So answer is what we're going to do calculating along the way. And at the very end, we assign answer to the output variable that is depreciation amount. Now we need to get into our logical tests to determine depreciation amount. All right, so we're going to structure this as a series of if statements. Right, we're going to have if then, and an else if, and an else if, and we're going to run through each possible kind of combination of options we could have. So let's start out by saying if, and we'll say that the method is equal to D 
then and we'll do our end if. All right, so we've set up our basic if function. We have our start, if, then, and then our end if that comes later. So let's just start out with double declining balance calculation. So in this case, our answer would be equal to the amount of the asset, right? The asset's value divided by the useful life. That'll give us one year's worth of depreciation, but times two because we're in double declining balance, all right? That would be our answer if double declining balance is selected, but only if it's not section 179. So we need sec 179 to also equal no. So here we need a little bit more logical work. So here we're gonna type in and, right? Just like in Excel regular, we can use and to basically connect two logical tests together. In this case, we wanna make sure that method is equal to D and sec 179 is equal to no. As long as both those conditions are true, then this is gonna be the right calculation for how much depreciation to take, All right? If those aren't the case, well, now we need more conditions. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to our next line and type else if. So let's say method is equal to S. So we'll start with straight line, then. So now we have our second logical test. But again, we realize that whatever straight line depreciation we calculate is only gonna be true if we have section 179 equal to no. So we're gonna use this and operator here. So we connect those two together. And now let's calculate what is the straight line depreciation. Well, in this case, let's say straight line depreciation calculation. In this case, we don't have to multiply by two. And so it's just the amount divided by the useful life. Now we can anticipate that makers is gonna be the next one we do. So let's copy that code, go down to makers. So switch this from a D to an M. Still, if section 179 equals no, that's required here. And for the makers, we do the double declining balance. So let's copy that, but we only do one half of that. So let's multiply that by one half, All right? It's a little bit silly that we're both multiplying by two and then undoing that by multiplying by one half, but it's a little bit more clear that way that we're actually doing the maker's depreciation calculation. So we've connected this series of if, else if, else if. So have we covered all the options? Well, the first option is D and no, one possibility, S and no, M and no. All right, obviously the other option is if it's D, S, or M, and yes, right? But if it's any of those and it's also equal to yes, we can just put that under one line here. So we can say else if section 179 equals yes, then we can do our last bit of calculation. And in this case, all we need to do is the answer divided by two, because it's always going to be over two years in this case. So now we've calculated our answer four different ways based on the method and the section 179 calculation. So now let's go see if this is actually working for us over in the Excel file. All right, so let's type our function in, depreciation amount. Now, say you accidentally forgot what order those variables went in, All right? We can't really necessarily see it right here, but what we can do is go to this FX button. If we click FX up here, it pops up and it tells us our variable names. This is one reason why it's important to actually choose variable names that are meaningful, because it can actually cue the user into what to reference. So here the amount, well, that's gonna be there, useful life, method, and section 179. So we say okay to all that, and we get that the depreciation on this asset should be 1,429. Let's change our method to straight line. We get the same answer, double declining balance. We get twice the depreciation, that makes sense. Section 179, let's check that out. Everything's looking good so far. Now let's assume that the user actually is messing with us a little bit, right? And users are not always gonna try to mess with your code, right? They're not trying, they're, no, people aren't out there to try to break your code unless you ask them to, to basically help debug it. But sometimes they're just gonna put in things you didn't anticipate. 
they don't know the code like you do, so they're going to put in the wrong values. So for example, Bob decides he's just going to put his name in here, right? He's not going to put yes or no, he's going to put Bob. And what do we see? We get an answer of zero. Notice that we don't have an error message, right? There's no error message here because no error has really been made, right? We just initiated our value of answer is zero. We then had none of our different if conditions were true. Let's go see that, right? Is this true, that section, the method is equal to D and section 179 equals no? No, section 179 is right now equal to Bob, right? So this is not a true statement. The second one, also not true, nor is the third. Our last sec statement, section 179 is not equal to yes, so none of these statements are true, which means we never calculated this answer value. All we have is the original value of when we initiated it. And when we initiate that variable, it's going to be equal to zero. That means when we get down here at the bottom, depreciation amount is also equal to zero, which is why we see zero in our answer cell. So once we have Bob here, we've kind of messed everything up. And now we'd like to handle that situation and do something about it. All right, so what can we do? Well, let's flip back over. And there's one more thing we can use within the if statement, right? We have if then, we then have else if, and now we can put on an else at the very end. So the else is going to capture anything else. So if these first four statements are not true, then it's going to do what's in the else statement at the very end. So here, let's say answer is equal to negative 999. You'll see negative 999 show up in a lot of programming and a lot of data sets, and it usually indicates that something's wrong, right? It's a value that you shouldn't see. You should never see negative depreciation. So the fact that we see a negative number should kind of clue you in. This means something's wrong. But let's see if it works when we go back to our function. So we go back in, whoops, not to there. We go into our function, recalculate it, and now we see our negative 999 that clues us in that something's wrong, right? Can we do a little bit better? Yeah, I think we can. Because it'd be nice to give the user some message to tell them what might be wrong. All right, so let's actually flip back over and let's change this answer now to be sure to use D, S, or M for method and yes or no for section 179. All right, so we have a nice message out there to tell the user what might be wrong. So let's check on that. Let's come back over, and we get a value error. Why are we getting a value error? Because we have what is an, a, a double number that we're trying to put words into. We're trying to put a string variable inside that answer. So now we need a way to have a variable type that could be either a word or a number. And we have that variable type, and it's called a variant. All right, so we need our depreciation amount to be a variant, which could be either a number or a word. And we also need our answer variable up here to be a variant. So once we have a variant, it can be either or, and let's see what that does to our answer. Now we click in F2, and now we get a usable message that our user can say, oh, I need to check what I have up here. Oh, let's put this back to yes. Now I get a value that's reasonable, my depreciation is fixed. If I mess things up and put whoops here, whoops, it didn't work. Let's fix that and maybe I put Y up here. Well, there I actually get an answer. Why do I get an answer though? All right, let's go look. I messed up the depreciation method, but section 179 is yes. So as long as section 179 is yes or no, or is yes, this function will return something. If instead this is no and we mess up the earlier line, we're going to get an error message back. If we get that one right and we get them both right, now we can get a value out. So we have to be very careful about what type of variables we're using. Variant is that variable type that allows us to kind of use words or numbers in our variables.